It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello, and welcome to episode 320 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday, the 9th of December, 2018. I'm Ed Brown, and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hi. And this is the third week of our 10-week campaign, I guess, to support the Fred Hollows Foundation and Doctors Without Borders. This is in memory of Penelope Green, a close friend of ours, a fan of the show. She sadly passed away in November this year, and we've decided to donate all of the Patreon contributions we get for 10 weeks to those charities in her honour. Uh, so if you want to be a part of that, just head to scienceontop.com slash donate. And on the show today, we'll be talking about a possible explanation for dark energy and dark matter, a clinical trial of a male contraceptive, electrotherapy for treating depression, and how giant tortoises could help us live longer. And let's begin with that, because I remember Lonesome George, yeah, I remember mm. Lance and George. <laughs> Good times. Good yeah. times. Well, not for well, George. Kind of boring, really, um, <laughs> until he died. Yeah. <laughs> Lonesome George was the giant tortoise that became the last of his species before he died in 2012. At the ripe old age of 101, or possibly 102, though there aren't any official birth records around, we're not sure precisely. And some experts, even David Attenborough, believe George was only in his 80s or even younger, possibly. But the point is, 101 isn't even all that old for a giant tortoise. There have been some that have died in their 170s and 180s. And now, Penny, the sequencing of Lonesome George's DNA has revealed a number of genes that could give us clues about human life expectancy and particularly cancer. Is that right? Yeah, and I thought this was really interesting because it's one of those stories where you're like, oh, yeah, of course you should do that. That's a good idea. <laughs> but I would never have thought to do it myself. Mm. Um, what I always, every time I read a statistic like this, it always gives me pause and a reflection. And humans and giant tortoises share 90% of their DNA, which to me just sounds huge. But when you that ten percent's a very important ten percent. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, usually when something is ninety percent, it leads to something very similar. And I guess from you know an alien coming to Earth and observing mm. all the different kinds of life that there are, a tortoise and a human probably are very similar. But to us, from our perspective, obviously they're quite different. They're not even mammals, but they still do have a lot of DNA. So we can we can really kind of have a pretty good guess at what their genes are doing and their function and so on. So it's not um, that we're not trying to deal with something that's completely different from people. So what they've found in looking at giant tortoises, which are, as you said, very long lived, is spe specifically some genes that are duplicated in the tortoise that aren't in humans. And understanding that, means that genes that are duplicated often function a bit differently. So it could be that some of these genes and some of these genes that are duplicated do seem to be genes that are linked to cancer development. I mean, obviously some cancers can be caused by external factors, but um, there is a genetic component of, you know, cells copying and mistakes in that copying, which is like, yeah, if something goes wrong in this gene, then um, instead of just a usual life cycle of the cell, it can become um, cancerous. So that's really, really cool because it could be that these duplications somehow impact um, their ability to live long lives. And one of the reasons that they live long lives is it's not that they're immune to cancer. They do get cancers, but they have really, really low rates of cancer. So it could be that their low cancer rates uh, because of some kind of mechanism that means that they don't make as many mistakes when their cells divide as mammals like humans do. It's actually really, really interesting for people, but it also could be quite good 
at um, f- helping conserve giant tortoises because these tortoises are endangered, vulnerable, critically endangered, extinct, you know, they're not exactly um, flourishing. So perhaps the better understanding about their characteristics and so on might help us know a bit more about them and help to preserve their populations in the wild where possible and rebuild them. So I just thought this was interesting. I really liked it because it reminded me, you know, that animals are very similar to each other. And even though I think sometimes we read about stories like, oh, you know, blah, 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 but it was just a mouse model. And look, when it comes down to Mm. actual treatments or doing things, that's very true. But in terms of just getting ideas and getting understanding, I mean, I probably, like, I mean, as we were talking about last week, it's not like we're going to go, okay, well, let's just like, Use CRISPR to put extra copies of these genes. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I'm not joking, by yeah, the way. Like, no, I'm just it, saying it's it, like, like this is like boom, a thing. But it might, if we understand better the mechanisms that are happening and we can understand these animals better too for their own sake. Sure. It, it also reminds me of the story we did the other week of mm. the taxonomy and just how different a bacteria is from a human but so many of those eukaryotes, yeah. those animals, are genetically so, very so similar. similar. Uh, did they say how many genes they found that had these similarities or these duplication differences? Was it a lot or are we talking just, you know, three or uh, four? They said several. So I'm not sure what that exactly, what number that would um, mm-hmm. translate to. So, yeah, more than two, more but than two, probably but less, less than, than a dozen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It it's always makes me wonder why some animals get cancer and some are so prone to not getting cancer. Like, you know, sharks mm. don't get have very high rates of cancer. They do get cancer. They just don't have high rates of it. What are they doing differently? Not using GMO crops. I think that's oh, the... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so good they don't going. live near mobile phone towers. Oh. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wind Wind turbine. Turbine. yeah. It does make me wonder if there's a payoff in some way. Like, I don't know, you get to live a long time, but mm. you're a bit low or some other. I don't know. Well, not that I sharks mean, are slow, but you know what I mean? No, but that's a really good point. We're often told we need to be exercising more and that'll reduce our risk of heart disease and heart cancers and things. Giant turtles aren't well known for speeding around the place. <laughs> Maybe we should have more sedentary lifestyles. <laughs> but imagine the, the, the strength training that they do just lug, lugging that skull. That's not skull. Um, what's it the called? Shell. shell. The, the yeah. built-in resistance training. Yeah. <laughs> uh, very interesting. Uh, let's move on now and look at how research into epilepsy has accidentally led to some exciting new developments in the treatment of depression and mood disorders. Lucas, this is a serendipitous line of inquiry that came from observations of patients having electrical stimulation of some areas of the brain. Is that right? Yes, correct. So th- these were direct um, direct stimulation of the brain uh, using basically wires, electrodes that were implanted into the brains of the patients, which wasn't done just for the purpose of hey, let's just see what happens if we stick these. They were actually uh, receiving some treatment for epilepsy. <laughs> so um, the, the the epilepsy, you know, the, this particular uh, treatment is, is approved for use for treating certain types of um, seizure disorders, including ep- epilepsy and um, Parkinson's and a few other things like that. So um, so it was within the context of that. But basically they got permission from these um from these patients to do some tests whilst they had these things in there. And they were particularly interested in the, uh, a particular subset of these patients, there were about 25 of them in this particular study, who had experienced symptoms of depression. Uh, and were currently, during you know, uh, this period of time, were, were you know, experiencing symptoms of depression. And interestingly, and further backing up some, some previous studies that have found similar results, um, these people reported pretty much an immediate uh, change in their moods um, to the point that they, you know, several of them commented immediately after the procedure, I feel so much better. What did you just do? Like, 
So there, there have been some previous studies, as I mentioned, in, in you know, doing similar things. And the area of the brain that's of particular interest here is the lateral uh, orbitofrontal cortex. So this particular area of the brain has got, it's basically, uh, as described in the, the article, is, is basically a, considered a good on-ramp to, to certain parts of the brain that are involved in regulating mood. So there's, over the years, there's been, there's, you know, we've had these camps. On one camp, there's been the the those who who strongly feel that um, disorders such as depression are perhaps due to a chemical imbalance in the brain. And of course, this is where a lot of the um, available medication is is uh, what the, what this medication is targeting. Um, but there's you know the other the, the other camp has been more on the um, you know, this it's it's all thoughts that are regulating this sort of stuff. It's 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 your personality and and their experiences and that sort of thing. Well, this is a, a an alternative pathway or an alternative train of thought, which is that rather than a chemical imbalance, this is more about some wiring problems in the brain, and particularly in the way that the cells uh, in various neurotransmitters actually communicate with each other. So stimulation, electrical stimulation, uh, basically can cause them to um, increase or change the way that they uh, that they communicate. So it's a it's a different it's a different mechanism that they're targeting. Um, it doesn't appear, based on these studies, that stimulation leads to long term changes. In fact, it, it peters off very very rapidly after the treatment. So sort of a few minutes or a few it, hours. It wasn't specific about that, but I certainly got the impression that it was was you know within certainly within a day you know sort of time frame that that, that there was a, a right. decrease in that sort yeah. of uh, uh, impact. Now, it's probably not a viable treatment option to walk around with brains hanging out of your head. Uh, sorry, brains wires. I mean wires. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not having brains. <laughs> <laughs> All wires, brains. <laughs> You're doing something very wrong if your brains are. That means you've got a very open mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's probably not a long-term sort of treatment option, but it does open up certainly, you know, a, a lot of really cool questions as to what what impact do these pathways have. And neurotransmitters, what are they? You know, what's what's their involvement here? Because there might be other ways that we can we can target this, um, and maybe you know it might turn out to be a mix of, of all of these different um, uh, thoughts as to what could be regulating the the uh, the mood. So, yeah, very very interesting. As I say, it's not the first time there have been other other ones, but this one was particularly interesting because they actually set out as a part of the study to do some of this because they knew that they were going to have wires that were in you know, the right place to, to stimulate the, um, the, the oral uh, uh, frontal area. So that's what they did. And they also, uh, you know, in order to just make sure that there wasn't some kind of uh, bias being introduced in, in the situation, um, they repeated the stimulation without the actual stimulation. Basically, they went through the process with these patients and waited to see whether they reported, you know, similar changes in mood. And and without the electrical stimulation, they did not report changes in mood. So that kind of, you know, although it's not a blinded trial as such, um, you know, because the, the, the researchers, the technicians and so forth knew that they weren't simulating, so therefore they could have been communicating that. They hadn't communicated, as, as I understand it, they hadn't communicated in the first place that this thing would actually have an impact. So if anything, the second time round, I'm assuming, would have actually increased expectation from the patients because they had previously experienced a, a, an improvement in mood after receiving this treatment, if that makes sense. What that, it, no, it does, but it also doesn't show that it's stimulation of that particular spot that is triggering the uh, mood changes. It could be any electrical yes. stimulation will cause yes. that effect. But obviously, previous studies have pinpointed correct. That, that is that is that is correct, and and uh, previous studies have also found that there have been some benefits to areas around this area. So it, it doesn't even seem to be a specific place. But it's more just this this larger sort of uh, this area, which is basically just above the eyes. So yeah, it's look, it's really interesting. I love seeing stuff like this because um, neurology just absolutely fascinates me. And uh, you know, someone who who deals with depression myself, it's 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 always interesting to see what the what what studies are being done and what the the current thinking is. 
but uh, with anything, as with anything else, you know, it's always nice to go. Well, it's it's not just it's not just my personality. It's you know what I mean. It's it's uh, I'm not some sort of failure in, in having these things. There's actually Absolutely. physical brain circuitry involved in this stuff. Oh, definitely. Uh, it also reminds me that we need to follow up with Sean Elliott and see if there's been any uh, progress with. Yeah. He was doing a trial. I don't know if you remember. I do. Uh, which I think was it was with. Um, magnetic stimulation rather Ooh. than direct electrical stimulation and i think he's found that he had a lot of improvement when they were doing that so it would be interesting to see if that was the same area mm. if it was that study is completed and what they found so i'll uh, make a note to follow up and talk to him about that yeah absolutely and i know um i think i've talked about before the electroconvulsive therapy which has yeah. you know long been around and I, and I have a very close friend who who had been suffering quite severe depression um, and, and went through a, a, a series of treatments uh, with ECT and that actually had a, a huge impact on her, um, a, a very positive one. So, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Yeah. Okay, Penny, well, let's talk contraception now. And when it comes to hormonal birth control, it's pretty much a ladies-only club. For decades, researchers have been trying to develop a male pill, but with not a great deal of success. A reasonably large-scale trial is now about to get underway, with couples from seven countries around the world. Uh, it's a trial of a male contraceptive gel. How does the gel work? It's really interesting. There's, um, I feel like it's been shown it is harder to provide a contraceptive like a hormonal contraceptive for men because it's not like one egg once a month but you know millions and millions of sperm every single day and you have to get every single one um this gel is a a combination drug it has a progestin hormone and testosterone so the idea is that the first hormone will lower the sperm count but it also produces unfortunately side effects like acne weight gain lowered libido which any women who've taken the pill will be like yep know about that so no one likes side effects and side effects like that I think it's sort of almost accepted with women that you have to try a few pills before you find one that works for you if in fact any do work for you um, but you don't I don't think anyone's like, yay, I'm going to be like spotty and put on lots of weight and have no sex drive. This kind of defeats the purpose that I went on the pill in the first. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. But um, so the testosterone is, has been added to sort of counteract these effects, make it a bit more pleasant to be on while still keeping sperm counts low. So we have talked about sort of development of male contraceptives before. Um, but what I was really interested in is and this is just maybe a silly reason to talk about this story, is how they found the volunteers for this trial. So as you said, it's something like 420 couples from all across the world. Um, they need to use the gel for about, I think, 20 weeks to make sure that the, or the man has to use the gel for 20 weeks to make sure that his sperm count is gone. We should, yeah. we should say this is just a gel that they apply to their shoulder. Yeah, just neck. to the this shoulder. Yeah. So. <laughs> I totally, yeah. yes, that's, I'm glad you said that because I'm thinking, wow, you just got to give, yeah, okay. No, I'm with you. Cool. Well, that we'll is one up. way to make sure they apply it often. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you went there. Oh, my God. Just every day, just apply the, yeah. Apply. Um, yeah, question, doctor. Can I apply it several times a day? Is that okay? <laughs> Sorry, it's a, it's like a shoulder, an arm and shoulder gel. Yeah. Anyway, back to the story. <laughs> um, so they have to wear, they have to use it for twenty weeks, and then use it as their only pregnancy prevention for the next year. So it obviously has to be couples that are sort of cool with trying for a baby over the next year. But then after the trial is over, they need to um, be monitored for another six months just to make sure that the reversal in the sperm count isn't permanent, like it goes back when you stop using the gel. So they also have to be couples who are not only just cool with having a baby in the next year, but also potentially cool with permanent infertility and having an IVF baby later on. Like, So it's, it's mm. props to those couples that are... Um, 
doing this. It is. Like, it is. It's a good point, though, Penny. It's like it's pretty hard to to have like that that criteria of so. So to be involved in this study, you've kind of be just kind of a what ifs attitude to having a baby. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. yeah. And that's, happy if I have a baby. Happy if um, I don't have a baby. Never have babies. <laughs> and look, yeah. you know what? Yeah. Maybe it's like it's one of those things where it's actually pretty sure it's going to work. Like it's not, yeah, you know. I think. And maybe the people who are doing it are like, you know what? This is really, really important and it's worth it for me. I have no idea. Like, um, So I thought that was really interesting because I think um, having like a really reliable male hormonal contraceptive would benefit everyone, men and women. Um, The other interesting thing about this study is that they're also looking at both parts of the couple. And I know this is very focused on couples, but I mean, obviously single men would be able to use this contraceptive as well once it works. But to make sure that, um, that they're looking not just at how the person taking the drug is going, but also their, you know, their life, their, their partner. And it's interesting because, you know, having been on the pill myself, I mean, it can cause like really emotional side effects and changes and mm. so on. So it's, it's good to sort of to understand the big picture, like messing with hormones. I'm so grateful that we can do it, but it's not necessarily fun. Sure, which is, well, and I know you and I are in agreement on this, I think, that the best contraception, uh, which is a more most often a permanent solution, is just the SNP. Yeah. Is for a vasectomy. Yeah. Um, you don't, it, it's over very quickly. It's relatively free of discomfort mm. and it's very effective. It's very effective, but you've got to be, you've got to be sure. So yep. you can't say, oh, look, I'm, I'm 18 and I don't want a baby now, but... Mm. And you've got to be comfortable with a doctor with a knife down there. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't think they use a knife as such. Not perhaps <laughs> as you would, you know, think of a knife. It's not like, you know, that's not a knife. That's a knife. No, it's not. Yeah. That's not what's happening down there. You think it could be scissors? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's anyway. a scalpel. It's not like anyway. a Bowie knife in any case. You know. No. Unfortunately for people everywhere, um, it's still such a long way away from being approved um Mm, this trial won't be wrapped up even till 2022 and then there's going to need to be well if you you know you've got to at least have a year year you know 20 weeks of trying six months after so that's almost two years of literally just time that has to pass let alone anything else um so it's another case of five to ten years before this is useful to (laughs) it is another case of five to ten years but always like that Everything has to start somewhere, I suppose, and I'm sure I'm very grateful for all sorts of things that I don't know about that five to ten years ago someone was like, oh, I've got this, like, great thing, but, yeah, mm. it's not ready yet. Yeah. Well, particularly when this has been something that's been in development for decades. Yeah. I mean, this particular gel, I think they started working on that back in 2009, and there have been other hormonal attempts with uh, men f- before that, so... We're getting a lot closer. Yeah. This is the the biggest trial that we've seen of this sort of a thing to date. I think there was one that stopped in 2016 because that had some adverse effects. Uh, that was a, an oral uh, a pill. But uh, I think we're definitely making progress and this is around the corner. So that's encouraging. Okay, Lucas, this week you and I both found articles about a revolutionary new theory that could explain one of the greatest mysteries of the universe, namely what makes up 95% of the universe. Do you want to give us a sort of a a simplified rundown of what this is all about? Yes. So this was, as you say, this is one of these things that I'm not quite sure why it suddenly garnered media attention because it was actually in some mainstream media as well. It appears that one of the lead authors of the paper that was published actually a year ago, um, Jamie Farns, basically it appears that Jamie's article in The Guardian maybe was the the, the thing that sort of kick-started the, the recent coverage because Jamie had published an article in The Guardian on the 5th of December. Then there was a series of tweets from him explaining what the theory was. So... This, this this theory, this, this proposed theory is that 
Um, perhaps the answer to dark matter and dark energy might actually be the same thing. Now, if you can't quite recall, um, dark matter is the placeholder for the thing that we don't understand that appears to give the extra mass to galaxies that stops them from basically spinning apart because of their rotation rates um, uh, and the amount of mass in them, the, the typical mass that we think of as physical things, which is baryonic matter, that stuff is not enough to hold the galaxy together. It should actually spin apart given that it's, its rotation rate, but uh, it doesn't. So um, there's certainly uh, indications of, of something that gives extra gravity to galaxies and globular clusters and so forth, uh, which is not made up of or not from the, the things that we can observe that, that actually give off light or you know absorb light like dust and stuff like that. So that's where dark matter comes into it. Dark energy, on the other hand, is, is, is actually the placeholder for what appears to be expanding the universe, the space in between everything, um, and accelerating that expansion. Now, um, those two things are basically different things. Um, and and all, despite the fact that they share dark in their in their name, the dark is basically we, we don't know. We don't know what this is. That's that's what the dark means. Now, this uh, this theory proposes a, a different approach to the problem, which is that perhaps um, the fundamental thing that is driving both the expansion of the universe and the fact that galaxies aren't flying apart could be uh, matter that has negative mass, negative mass matter, which quite mm -hmm. rightly you're going to go, what, uh, WTF? What the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so what is negative mass? So I kind of, uh, I, I think of this as if you, you may have seen uh, representations, 2D representations of space-time. Usually, they have some sort of um, grid-like uh, membrane drawn and then something with great mass sort of in the middle, which is causing the grid-like uh, surface to dip down in the middle. Uh, imagine you, you, your stereotypical bowling ball sitting on a trampoline. You've probably seen those diagrams to describe the distortion of space-time, the fabric of space-time, because of something that's very, very massive, because we know that gravity does distort. That's why we have gravitational lensing. That's why we – basically, that's a fundamental principle of, of what holds, um, you know, uh, things that are in orbit in orbit. So that's how – that's how we think of, of, of something that has positive mass. It causes this depression, this, this gravity well, if you like, in, um, uh, in the fabric of space-time. Think of something with positive mass as creating more of a gravity mountain or a gravity hill. You know, basically, it, it causes a, a, an inverse of that. It's something that, that causes things to fall away from it instead of towards it. So, I mean, that sounds fantastic. It sounds like something that's straight out of science fiction. Um, but funnily enough, there's actually precedent for this. This is something that has been proposed going back a very, very long time in multiple different guises. Um, the point is, it's uh, it's kind of weird. Um, we don't know that, that matter with negative mass does actually exist. Uh, it's certainly not something that we have seen and observed, you know, within any capacity that we have. However... When you talk about, we've, we've often talked about models on the show. I love models. Models are cool. When you when you build a model, whether it's a mathematical model or, or even a physical model, it doesn't really matter. It's some sort of model which helps you to, to come out with the same result as what reality is telling you. So you use a model and say, okay, if I feed all the observational data in here, I should, using this model, it should spit out things that actually match what we're seeing. Um, and by the same token, if we put things in there that we've not seen yet, it should give us certain predictions so that when we do see certain things, we can go, well, that matches the predictions. So this is really what's been uh, created as a part of this paper, which is this new theoretical model, which a 3D computer model, which, which basically builds this hypothetical universe whereby there is negative mass. It's described as a fluid. I don't quite understand what, how fluid comes in, but... It, it's apparently a fluid <laughs> and or has fluid like something um, and it, it is the thing that basically is uh, is driving the expansion of the universe because 
it has the opposite effect of gravity. Now, how then does this fit into the gravity situation with, with galaxies, right? Because, you know, you'd think then if it was the same thing that was in galaxies, then it should actually be pulling them apart, not holding them together. Um, and apparently the, the answer to that is because it's negative gravity, if you push on it, it pushes back. Um, and that's kind of freaky and weird and, and, and hard to kind of get my head around. Um, but that's, that's what's being proposed here. So, um, does it make sense? Not at all. Not to me. Um, there's, <laughs> it's, it's confusing. Uh, it, it doesn't relate to anything that I'm familiar with, but I really love the thought that it could, I mean, mm. for something to come out and say, um, all right, well, this actually, this mechanism would actually explain both of these things that we've seen with our observations. That has appeal. Instantly, that has appeal. Uh, and it's one of the things, it's exactly the same reason that string theory is so hard to deal with for me, because string theory... You know, so many aspects of string theory invoke stuff that we've never seen or have any reason to suspect other than string theory says, oh, there, there must be then 10 dimensions or 21 dimensions or something like that. It's like, well, okay, but that's just hard to sort of – that seems the opposite of Occam's razor, it really, doesn't it? It's like, well, there must be extra dimensions. That's the only way to describe it. Anyway, so um, I hope that's that's sufficiently confused you, uh, listener. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm none the wiser. <laughs> yeah, me too. But uh, no, it's an interesting theory. And anything that can try and explain those two fundamental unknowns about the universe is always interesting. So it's very cool. All right. That's our show. As always, the links are on the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com 320. Don't forget to check out scienceontop.com slash donate to become a Patreon. And remember, for the next seven weeks, we're giving all our donations to Penelope Green's favourite charities. Thank you for joining me today, Penny and Lucas. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. NASA's Mars InSight landed a little over a week ago. One of the mission projects is going to be to get pictures, but the other part of it is to detect motion. And they kind of got a sweet surprise as they started to hear sounds from Mars. Check it out. It almost sounds like a heartbeat, right? But it was actually wind moving over the solar panels. There were two parts of the inside that was able to pick it up. One was an air pressure sensor, the other one a seismometer. Now that might, might sound familiar to you because that also measures earthquakes, but it was able to detect the wind vibrations. Such cool stuff.